Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I am Lanisha Lightborn, the Business Development Manager for Asset Management and High Net Worth Services at the Bermuda Business Development Agency, also known as the BDA. The BDA is an independent public-private partnership, and our focus is on promoting the jurisdiction and encouraging economic development and inward direct investment. We have teamed up with Step Bermuda for a series of webinars, which we are hoping to continue throughout the year. Today, we bring together some of the industry's subject matter experts to discuss developments in EU blacklisting, some predictions, and the future, and why it remains an important area for international financial centers. Thank you again for joining us today. I will now hand it over to the chairman of Step Bermuda Branch, Ashley Fife. Many thanks, Lanisha, and thank you to everyone that has tuned in today. Um, we at Step Bermuda are very pleased to be working with the Bermuda Business Development Agency uh, to uh, produce these uh, presentations. And today we're, we're very grateful and we have a record attendance uh, for uh, Oliver Cooper and Robert Raymond of Steichman Elliott, who will be presenting on uh, EU blacklisting. Just a little bit about Oliver and Robert. Uh, Oliver leads Steichman Elliott's policy group and advises private and public clients on international tax and regulatory matters. Oliver acts as counsel for the IFC Forum, the trade body for professional services firms in the overseas territories and Crown dependencies, as well as having advised a number of governments in IFCs on international matters. He he is experienced in both UK and EU politics. Robert, uh, Robert specializes in Canadian and international tax. He advises, on, uh, advises financial institutions and high net worth families on international wealth structuring with a focus on tax, information exchange and estate planning and the international regulatory environment, uh, particularly for families in Canada, Latin America and Europe. Robert also advises on political risk mitigation strategies for international and in-country assets on mergers and acquisitions in the trust and corporate service provider industries and on Canadian transnational trust companies. With that, it's now a pleasure to hand over to uh, Oliver and Robert. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Ashley. And uh, thank you to, uh, uh, to our hosts as well, uh, uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure for Oliver and I to be here, uh, be here today, to talk to you about the uh, the EU's uh, tax blacklist project. Uh, please do use the uh, the Q and A uh, tab at the bottom of your screens uh, to uh, to ask us ask us questions, which we will uh, do our best to address uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of our discussion. So I'm going to start with an overview uh, before handing over to uh, to Oliver. So first of all, we're going to look at what are the drivers for the blacklist project, and here we're going to talk a little bit about the politics both within the EU, but also the uh, the EU's geopolitical position globally. Both those are very important to understand uh, how the EU has gotten to where we are today, and. In terms of where we've gotten today, how did we get to where we are today with this project? So what's the story so far? And what do the members of the European Parliament have in mind? Or what do they want to achieve after adopting a resolution earlier this year to blacklist uh, certain jurisdictions, particularly those with uh, zero or no tax? Uh, what sanctions have been adopted by the EU? Uh, it has taken EU members a while to adopt, uh, to, to determine and adopt sanctions. Um, and finally, what's the future of the Blacklist project? Uh, where might the EU take this project? Where might the economic substance rules go from here? And what's interesting is that in the EU's material, there are indications as to where they want to go to next. And that's what we'll look at uh, towards the end of the talk. And now I'll pass over to, uh, to Oliver. Thank you very much, Robert. And, and thank you to uh, BDA and, and Step Bermuda um, for, uh, for hosting us today. 
Um, I can go to the next slide. There you go. I know it feels sometimes like you're in a goldfish bowl that everything is, is, is pointing at you and that the blacklist must be directly concerning and targeted at ISCs like Bermuda. But actually, to an extent, Bermuda is just collateral in a project that has many different drivers internally and externally to the EU. So this slide addresses why the blacklist, why the EU, and, and why now? And why the blacklist is fundamentally because of politics. It's been, it's been exasperated, uh, exacerbated by, um, by COVID, but for the last decade, EU member states and governments around the world have tried to square the circle of demands for greater public spending, but also a need to close long-standing budget deficits. And that's not gonna get any easier. So the blacklist is one way that governments can try to claim or actually to close that tax gap that they um, suggest uh, exists and that allows them to square that circle. The second, why the EU? Well, it's fundamentally institutional and it's about a battle between institutions within the EU. Without getting into a political science lecture, there are three major institutions in the EU. The European Council, which represents the 27 member states, the European Commission, the permanent civil service of the EU, and the European Parliament, the democratically elected parliament of the EU. And all three have different competences and powers, but one thing that they don't have, because the EU doesn't have, is a power over direct taxation income tax or corporate income tax. And so as a consequence, those agents within the EU that want the EU to become more federalist, more like a country would be and have more powers, have targeted the ability to take over tax powers um, as, as their number one priority. And one of the ways they're doing that, but by no means the only way, is by using the tax blacklist to take more control of those powers away from member states and hand them to the EU itself and to the European Commission, that permanent civil service. And the third thing is geopolitics. So why now? Well, it's fundamentally because most people in Brussels, and it's not a secret, know that the EU on current trajectory does not have much time as the world's, as a, as a global standard setter. For now, the EU has clout. For now, the EU has the ability to institute a blacklist to try to shape the international tax norms of the world. But soon it might not have that power. And so as a result, it's adopting this blacklist and other measures in the tax field to make sure that it can influence the world around it. Okay. There we go. So the, sorry, there you go. Um, so the story so far, in 2015, the European Commission uh, launched its, um, unilaterally launched as, as an institution, it launched its own blacklist. So it published a blacklist without any prior warning in June 2015. And that simply um, aggregated the blacklist that had been compiled by different member states. And that blacklist, because it hadn't been agreed by the member states, it didn't have the authority that only the member states, remember, it is a direct tax, a power of member states. They didn't give it, they didn't confer their authority, and so it didn't have any power or legal, um, legal force. However, the next year, the member states did agree to adopt black, uh, blacklist themselves and adopted in, in December 2016 blacklisting criteria. So that obviously, because it's a power of individual member states, whenever they want to exercise powers through the European Union, every single member state has a veto. They have to make every decision unanimously, what criteria to adopt, what procedure to adopt, and yes, how to implement the procedure, putting member states onto, putting jurisdictions onto blacklists or taking them off. So in 2016, they agreed that criteria and as an indication of the power of that veto, most member states wanted to include zero taxation, the absence of a corporate income tax regime as a criterion itself. So every jurisdiction that had no corporate income tax regime would be included per se. And that was objected to by a, a few member states, most notably the United Kingdom. Um, and they pushed back and they said, no, we can't include tax rates as a criterion itself because that would abrogate and breach the authority and sovereignty of member states potentially. And so as a result, instead of doing that, 
they said, well, if you have 0% corporate income tax or similar tax rates to 0%, then you have to have substance instead. And we all know what's happened there. So the next year, the, the, the first blacklist was adopted. And I have to say the first blacklist did not include any IFCs, an indication of the fact that the objective was not focused on IFCs. But as substance legislation was passed in 2018 and then amended afterwards, slightly more, the attention turned slightly more to, to IFCs. We know that Bermuda was blacklisted for about seven weeks in, in 2019. Cayman was blacklisted uh, for eight months in, in 2020. Uh, other IFCs have moved on and off the blacklist, but don't be fooled into thinking it is all about IFCs. To an extent, the IFCs are collateral to a much larger political project, and that's just a potted history of it. Um, within the European Union, uh, of those three institutions, it's the European Parliament that is most eager to press forward with controlling tax matters, and also in trying to target IFCs. So the first on why tax matters, well, the, e the European Parliament um, is, it, it has a direct mandate, but also has very limited responsibility because it is, unlike other parliaments, is maybe only an upper house, it's like the House of Lords in the UK, perhaps the Senate in Bermuda. It only revises legislation that comes from elsewhere, from the member states. And they've wanted, therefore, to wrest control and to exert their power in this field and try to therefore amend the criteria behind the blacklist and the process that's put forward. They also want to make sure the European Union itself has more resources. So they've tried to push for the consequences of the blacklist, being directly or indirectly, more revenue going to the European Union. You can see why they'd want that. So they've instituted a number of committees within the European Parliament, the, the latest uh, called FISC, as you can see on the screen, is just the fifth in a long lineage going back seven years. The first tax committee, tax two, a Pan the Panama Papers Committee of Inquiry, tax three, and now FISC. But FISC is a different form of committee to all the previous ones, and therefore represents, to an extent, a step change in the pressure that the European Parliament can bring to bear. Because all the previous four that, that we've outlined there, all of them have been temporary committees set up for specific short-term purposes. FISC, the tax subcommittee of the European Parliament, is a permanent standing committee and therefore has the ability to, over many years, build up a narrative that they want to see put into law. That narrative might only be a political one, but it's one that they've made clear they want to exercise and, um, and, and create. Um, so you can see that, in fact, in the resolution that, that Robert mentioned earlier, that was passed in January. So the European Parliament passed a resolution. It doesn't have the power of law. You can't stress that enough. It can't have the power of law because only member states are allowed to exercise legal authority in the, for, in, in the direct taxation sphere. So as a consequence, the European Parliament can only pressure member states into doing that. But in January, they sent a very clear and unequivocal symbol, a signal, because of the 750 members of the European Parliament, only 50 voted against the resolution that Robert mentioned earlier, that demanded that all zero tax jurisdictions be blacklisted. So you can see that that narrative, that message that's going to be sent is going to probably be sent for a while yet, because the vast majority of MEPs want to send it. But why? Well, there's four reasons we outline on this slide here. The first is it's very difficult for member states at any point to stand up for IFCs because one, it doesn't apply to them. The, the blacklist specifically does not apply to, to member states. It can't apply to Luxembourg, Netherlands, Malta. It couldn't apply to the UK when the UK was a member. And so as a result, it's almost a cost-free exercise for member states. And why would their governments want to expose themselves to domestic peril of standing up for IFCs, so-called tax havens. The second is that MEPs themselves are all quite low profile. Even the best known ones do not really stand up in the public attention to members um, of their own domestic parliaments or governments. Uh, most members of the European Parliament are elected by nationwide lists. They don't have direct personal mandates themselves and their powers are relatively limited. And so MEPs have chosen this as one of the areas to focus on 
because they know that the media will be interested in covering machinations in this field. The third is that IFCs can't directly fight back. When we come to tax policy, the EU wants to wrest control, and the Parliament in particular wants to wrest control from member states to the European Union and Commission itself. But if they did that directly, they would encounter a problem. They would have fight back from Germany or Ireland or Netherlands or Spain or Poland or anyone else. So as a result, they need to pick on third parties. And the third parties, the third countries that have the least clout geopolitically are those that have always been and aim to be neutral intermediators of capital rather than those that exert international geopolitical power. And so IFCs can't fight back. And the fourth is because of Brexit. So most of the IFCs that have been targeted have been British territories, and that's for various reasons. But more recently, MEPs have found it easier to target British territories because there's been a lot more business going through the European Parliament related to Brexit, but also because there's a lot more animosity and a lot less interest in keeping the UK and its territories on side noting back going back to the fact that MEPs are low profile, any um, fight or antagonism between the European institutions and the British family will inherently now, because of Brexit, get a higher profile in the press and maybe confer a higher profile on the politicians involved in that decision making process. Um, so the MEPs passed this resolution in January um, and it made a few demands on the reform of the tax blacklist. Make no mistake though, just to be, be, be clear, the European Parliament did not agree to create a blacklist itself. There have been some references in the past in the press to there being a European Parliament blacklist. And whilst they have threatened for that to be the case, they've not done that. They've asked for the European member states to change what the criteria were. So here are five ways that they've wanted to change, air, to change the blacklist and how it's constructed. The first is they want to go back, as was proposed before 2016, to having zero tax or very low rates as being a criterion per se. So all zero tax jurisdictions will be included regardless of substance or other regulations. The second is focusing more on British territories and that means not just in terms of their tone, but also in terms of the language used and the processes adopted to formulate the blacklist. So the resolution specifically singled out the OTs and the CDs, as well as the UK itself, for targeting and for examination. The third is they want to have a limitation on government support, whether from the EU or from EU member states, to businesses with, quote, economic links to low tax jurisdictions. Now, this declaration, because it doesn't have the power of law, did not go into a huge amount of detail about what that means, but it's safe probably to assume it would follow similar lines to the one that was adopted by Denmark, by Poland, by the uh, Scottish and Welsh governments and, and a few other governments around the world, limiting, for example, COVID bailout and business support to those companies that operate from or incorporated or managed in IFCs. The fourth is specific sanctions against the tax grey list. So as we know, most of the IFCs, the CDs and the OTs, by virtue of having 0% corporate income tax, started off in the process on the grey list, this halfway house, where they'd be subjected to greater scrutiny, but weren't on the blacklist itself. And right now, the sanctions that EU member states are required to adopt against blacklisted jurisdictions only apply to blacklisted jurisdictions. But the European Parliament said, well, it's all very good and well, but given that there's something off, there's this whiff of, um, of something wrong about those jurisdictions on the grey list, surely so long as the jurisdictions on the grey list, they should also be subject to some sanctions of some sort. And the fifth is the interrelationship between the EU's tax blacklist and its AML blacklist. They're written and drawn up in fundamentally different ways, but the European Parliament would like them to be effectively combined, mutually reinforces the language they use. So the inclusion on the EU's tax blacklist 
would create a presumption that a jurisdiction should be on the EU's AML blacklist, which requires enhanced due diligence, etc., cetera, of, um, of interactions uh, with entities based in those jurisdictions and vice versa. So the consequence of that is you could end up seeing the technical bases on which these things are being assessed being muddied more and politicized more as a consequence. So I mentioned sanctions there, um, but so far the sanctions have been um, adopted quite late in the process. So IFCs have been blacklisted. I've mentioned before Bermuda and Cayman. In addition to that, Bahamas was blacklisted uh, in 2018, removed uh, very swiftly afterwards. Um, but the sanctions the EU member states had to adopt against blacklisted jurisdictions were only put in place at the end of 2020. Member states were required or requested, but everyone's followed, um, followed that lead. They've been required to adopt at least one tax measure and one administrative measure. But the measures that have been adopted by different member states have been up to the member states. They've not been compulsory and they've not been imposed by the EU itself. That's in keeping with direct tax being a power of member states and not the EU. And the impact of that has actually been quite limited. So, for example, Germany denies the benefits, inverted commas, of being located uh, in different blacklisted jurisdictions. But actually, there are no benefits. It's not a preferential regime that the IFCs have. They simply have 0% tax. And so, as a result, the consequences for jurisdiction for businesses doing business in Germany are very limited due to that sanction. On the other hand, there have been sanctions that have been slightly more problematic. So, for example, Malta has introduced sanctions that are retrospective. So instead of looking just at who is on the blacklist now, they'll look at who was on the blacklist at any point in the previous financial year. And the consequence is, perhaps in future, if jurisdictions go on and off in a matter of weeks or months, the sanctions don't wear out and, and disappear after a matter of weeks or months, they might stay in the system for years to come. And I think I'm passing over to Robert there, if I screen can do that. That's great, Oliver. Thank you very much. So now let's look at the, uh, the future of the blacklist. Uh, where might uh, this project go next? The EU has been really successful with this to date. Just look at the economic substance legislation across IFCs. And uh, we can see that IFCs are now on an escalator. So where, will the, where might this escalator lead to next? Uh, it might lead to increasing requirements for substance. This could come in many different forms. Uh, it could simply be increasing the substance requirements for specific regular, uh, relevant activities. It could come in, in a softer form too, like, like was the case for funds. Uh, originally funds were excluded. Uh, now funds need to be registered. The registration of funds is soft substance in the sense that now the local governments can track funds better and then that will allow the EU to track what's going on more effectively as well with funds. And what about mission creep on relevant activities? And here I'm, I'm going to confine comments to uh, holding companies because I think that's probably what's uh, most of interest to, uh, to the STEP uh, community. Uh, might the EU seek to broaden the meaning of pure equity holding company? It's very narrow at the moment. And at least for now, we think that, uh, um, that, uh, that the EU will not, play, will not seek to broaden that. And here's why. When the EU was looking at uh, what determining which activities should be uh, relevant activities for its project, it looked at an OECD, OECD reports uh, in, in the BEPS projects. And the OECD referred to holding companies, but the reference to holding companies by the OECD was meant to exclude them from the OECD's uh, project. The EU misunderstood that and included holding companies as a relevant activity. And when they realized that, then they started to, we think, 
uh, get a little nervous because holding companies are subject to a much reduced uh, standard for economic substance. And so the concern was is that if the, if the meaning of a holding company was broad was broader, more companies could fit within the, the meaning of a holding company and therefore seek to comply with lower levels of economic substance, not the full economic substance that's, uh, that is um, applicable to other relevant activities. And that's why uh, it, 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 it could very well be that this narrow definition uh, for pure equity holding companies will, will be maintained, uh, at least for the moment. And what about and partnerships? Well, partnerships are now part of the economic substance uh, project. When I first started uh, preparing slides 18 months ago, two years ago, on where is this project going to go, funds were on my list of where is this going to go. Partnerships were on the list, and now they're both part of the uh, both funds and partnerships. Uh, partnerships more broadly, I mean, yes, originally it was partnerships that were separate legal entities, but both those types of vehicles, entities now are included. So we can see the escalator moving. And what about trusts? Are they going to be next? Uh, well, one, one relevant consideration there is Brexit. The, the UK is no longer a voice within the EU to uh, seek to keep trusts out of it, out of the project. Uh, and most, most uh, EU members uh, are, are civil law jurisdictions. Um, a lot of them really don't like trusts at all. So um, where might that go in terms of uh, are trusts going to be next? And as well, Will uh, the adoption of DAC 6 type reporting or OECD mandatory disclosure regime reporting, will these be added as criteria that need to be uh, adopted in order to remain on, a white on the whitelist? I mean, just to go back uh, a step, what is DAC 6? That's the European Directive on Administrative Cooperation. And this is the... Uh, this is intermediary reporting of cross-border uh, tax avoidance. What I like to refer to it as is it's disclosing to your government uh, about, what, how, about how the tax planning works. Uh, the, the OECD's uh, mandatory disclosure regime, uh, that deals with CRS avoidance transactions and uh, and disclosing uh, offshore opaque structures, structures that are designed to uh, hide beneficial owners. So are these types of reporting requirements going to be, become a criteria uh, that needs to be met in order to remain off a black or gray list? And again here, uh, Brexit um, may, may, may be relevant uh, because the UK, when it was part of the EU, needed to adopt and was going to adopt the, the full DAC 6 reporting. Uh, but since the UK has left the EU, it repealed a lot of the DAC 6 elements. So all the, all the elements regarding uh, reporting international tax avoidance were repealed. But the UK did keep the OECD MDR components on CRS avoidance transactions and the offshore opaque structures. So is that gonna make it easier for IFCs or the, the CDOTs to, um, uh, to, to confine what they will do in this area to the same as the, as the UK, meaning uh, only adopt MDR, or will the EU be successful in requiring adoption of the full, the more complete DAC 6 uh, type reporting. And, and well, well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, next slide, Oliver. I think Corin's in there. So, <laughs> thank you. So well, what about beneficial owner registers? Uh, well, the, the EU had uh, had discussions of, uh, of, of broadening uh, UBO requirements for 
uh, 2.2 jurisdictions. 2.2 refers to jurisdictions that are required to adopt economic substance uh, legislation. And the EU's original plan, and this is in the EU's June 2018 report. What the EU wanted to do is very ambitious here. Uh, it wanted direct real-time access to UBO registers in the in the in the Crown dependencies and overseas territories. And it wanted that access through a single in interconnected platform across multiple jurisdictions. What that means to me is what the EU was looking for was that somebody in Brussels could sit at their desk and go and tap into the UBO register in the, in the BVI or Bermuda or Cayman uh, and pull out whatever information they wanted and no one would know uh, that they had looked. But yeah, maybe, hopefully, thankfully, the, the EU, I th we think, has realized that it maybe needs to be a little bit more realistic with this, uh, uh, with its criteria uh, or its future criteria 1.4 regarding uh, UBO registers. Uh, and that's because we have to remind ourselves, as Oliver mentioned earlier, this is a vast project by the EU. It's not a project directly um, against uh, the, the British uh, territories. Uh, there are dozens of other countries that the EU has examined and analyzed uh, in terms of uh, their, their compliance. And the EU needed to look at this in the sense that, well, if their requirement for a UBO register and how access could be given or provided to the register was too broad, then the project might start to unravel a little bit because lots of jurisdictions might not permit uh, the EU to have direct real-time access to a non-public UBO register. So we will, we will have to see where this goes and there will be, we, we, uh, we do think that there's gonna be more discussion about this uh, over this year uh, within uh, within the EU as to how to proceed with UBO registers. And the hope is that existing or something close to existing arrangements that the Crown dependencies and overseas territories have with the UK will be sufficient. And what the, those arrangements simply mean that if the UK requests information, the, the, uh, the, the relevant overseas territory, for example, will provide that information uh, that comes from the UBO register to the UK very quickly. Uh, and so at the, at the end of that, what we would hope again is, uh, would be the case is that the Crown dependencies and overseas territories will be subject to the same UBO register requirements as other jurisdictions within the Blacklist project. And because uh, the CDOTs have the UBO registers are, they're already adopted. They're already giving information to the UK. So the, these mechanisms are in place. So hopefully that would mean that, uh, that the CDOTs would meet a future criteria 1.4 on uh, UBO registers. And now I'm gonna hand back to, uh, to Oliver to, to conclude uh, before we go on to Q&A. Thank you very much, Robert. So I think the conclusions that we think they're sensible to, to draw from this are that right now the focus has, has been on in the public, in the press, and, and perhaps in our own minds, has been on um, the CDs and OTs, including those that have been on the blacklist. But they're not directly in the the um, the crosshairs of the European Union. It's not deliberately aimed at those centres but it might be in future. Right now, the sanctions have not seemed to be directly harmful to those centers, but they might become in future. And on the European Parliament's actions, they don't have the power or authority to legislate in this field. So to an extent, they can maybe, when it comes to assessing what the regulatory position is now, be ignored. But when it comes to what the regulatory position in future will be, they probably can't be. So really, that's the message. And I think the, the lesson that needs to be taken from this is that collaboration across the 2.2 jurisdictions is key to make sure that it's not so easy to pick on them or to highlight any discrepancies or divergences between them and the other 
2.2 jurisdictions, the other zero tax jurisdictions. We've seen the Crown dependencies being very successful in weathering this storm by working together and making sure they collaborate on subsidy requirements, their subsidy requirements match each other. And I think that's a lesson that every jurisdiction in the world can learn from and copy in future to make sure that whatever happens and however this storm develops, we're in a position to weather it. I think we welcome any questions. Uh, yes, thank, thanks very much, Oliver and Robert. Very interesting talk. I uh, just wanted to start with an observation, that, that, that probably a relatively simple one, but perhaps it's the e one that the EU uh, tends to forget, that um, we see a lot, a lot of talk about zero tax regimes in, in circumstances where it's really only focused on in income and capital gains tax. I mean, Bermuda, for example, has land tax, payroll tax, stamp duties, and every jurisdiction's um, method of taxation or approach to taxation is, is, takes into account the nature of its economy, its economic needs, its infrastructure. And uh, so tax has evolved in different ways. I mean, there wasn't always uh, income tax. Uh, I, I believe that was a tax that, uh, a lot of the developing or developed nations uh, introduced during, during um, World War One. So um, I think perhaps that that's an element, in, uh, a point in terms of the fairness of approach and and uh, the EU in expecting um, analogous taxes to be in um, international financial introduced in international financial uh, centres. Uh, we've got a. A, a couple of questions here. Um, there was a, a, a comment that you made earlier about um, the EU losing its clout or fear, being fearful of losing its clout. Just wondering whether you could explore why, why you think that is. Yeah, very happy to. It's a, it's a great question. Um, Fundamentally, the EU is in relative decline. It doesn't mean it's an absolute decline, but there are a number of other powers around the world that have different norms when it comes to taxation, investment, and geopolitics and, and, and diplomacy. And if you look at, for example, uh, China, a lot of the rise of China has been because of Hong Kong and Singapore being on their doorsteps, offering, offering the world an ability to invest into China. If you look at opinion polls that are conducted of people in Vietnam. 97% in a recent poll by the Pew Center of Public Research were in favor of free market capitalism and international commerce. You wouldn't get a number anywhere near that in places in, in the European Union where because of the pressures brought about by the financial uh, crisis a decade ago and more recently by COVID, the public is more wary about cross-border financial flows and, 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 and structuring. Um, and so as a consequence, the norms are, are different. And as one part of the world rises, the other one inherently, when it comes to diplomacy and geopolitics, falls in, 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 in relative terms. And so that's really where it's, it's coming from. The question is, can, will the European Union insist on making its approach to developing a social market model? Because of course, those countries have social safety nets as well, but their approach and their, their policy on tax to, 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 to fit that model, will that become the international standard and that can only happen now rather than in the future when economically, diplomatically, militarily, in every other form, the EU's relevance is declining. And one of the other actors in this, in this field is the OECD. So you all have seen the OECD has its own program on clamping down on preferential tax regimes, on clamping down on, um, on, on, on zero tax jurisdictions as well, which it resumed in, in 2018. And the OECD has, has um, exerted its influence. It's, a, it's only a think tank, but an influential think tank made up of the most powerful governments in the world. Um, they've tried to exert their authority to create standards in this field as well. And one thing that's really key is that last week there was an election or an appointment of the new OECD Secretary General and the European member states expected a European to get that position because it was seen as being Europe's turn. And instead it was won by a former Australian finance minister. 
um, who has a very different approach to a lot of these questions to the European member states. And so even within the OECD, where almost two thirds of member states are members of the European Union, um, within the OECD, a lot of that power is, is, is eking away and, 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 and moving towards um, other poles in the world, North America, East Asia, and developing economies in Latin America and Africa. Uh, many thanks. Uh, just, oh, sorry, <coughs> go ahead, Randall. Well, I, I just to expand on that, because I, I recall at one point I was having a, a discussion with Richard Hay, and uh, we were talking about the interrelationship between the EU and the OECD. And he was saying in certain instances, one or the other of them might be our friends because they're busy fighting with each other. It is, does that play into this or are, are we just the bad guy in all scenarios? I think on that, it is worth remembering that the IFCs are, are not the direct target of this. It's really about power play within the European institutions. Um, so I think it's difficult to say that the, the IFCs are necessarily the, 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 the bad guys, but obviously that's where the public perception is. And one, one shouldn't fool oneself otherwise. Um, and on this, the OECD is, is, is not a government. It is not self-interested in terms of collecting tax revenue. Um, it's not trying to mold the world in, 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 in one person model because its member states have a huge diversity of different social models and tax systems within them because it's a global organization. Um, and so as a result, that plays out in how it goes about um, implementing its, its scheme. But I think if you, if you see them as being friend or foe in that way, I, I think you probably end up being misled about the nature of the projects. Uh, Oliver, you mentioned uh, ma uh, mandatory disclosure rules and how post-Brexit uh, the UK has maintained the, the approach to introduce those rules, but has dropped some of the provisions of DAC 6. With um, Britain's uh, approach, what, what do you think is the likelihood, and this is crystal ball, I know, uh, of mandatory disclosure rules being introduced in the near future or next year? in the uh, Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories? Well, I, I, can, um, I, I can start on that one. Uh, Oliver, jump in uh, uh, afterwards. Um, well, it, it has started already. Um, uh, Jersey Guernsey have, uh, for example, have, are either in the process or have committed uh, to adopt the, the OECD's mandatory disclosure rules. And, Maybe, maybe in Jersey too, some aspects of the of the DAC six directive. But it, the 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 way that the OECD organized the mandatory disclosure regime is the same way that they did the common reporting standard. So they put together this nice document uh, that everyone could just sign up to, uh, and they they commit to it, and then they sign it. They 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 sign it, and then they bring it into law, and they're in their in their in each jurisdiction. So I, I do think that the OECD will have success with its mandatory disclosure regime because that is a natural follow-up to the common reporting standard, which as we all know, uh, has been on the OECD side, a, a hugely successful project. So yes, I think that is, uh, that is coming. Uh, I've got a what may be a relatively complex or what I think is a relatively complex question from one of the attendees. Uh, do you see any fallout from the work now being commenced by FATF to assess the unintended consequences of the FATF standards? Do you think pressure will be brought on the EU by institutions like the IMF or World Bank to scale back its initiatives against IFCs because of those um, unintended consequences? I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, I think, so the, the work being done by FATF is, is to an extent unrelated. Of course, they're looking at the AML list and, and with regards to that, I think most of their focus has been on the impact on, 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 on Pakistan because there's an order of magnitude more economic impact there than, than elsewhere. Um, I think when it comes to pressure being brought by, by other institutions, um, the IMF and the World, or the World Bank are unlikely to be where that pressure is, is, is brought by. 
Um, we know that they're they're interested in, and, and, and monitoring this. It's their job to look at financial macroeconomic flows um, and, and financial flows and investment into, um, into developing countries respectively. Um, but more likely it's going to be pressure brought about by, by the OECD and other actors around the world um, that, might, that might contest or, or dispute the idea that, that, the, that the EU is, um, is able to un act unilaterally in this, in this field. Um, so there will be pressure from, from outsiders. There's been pressure from the, e, from the US, for example, as well. The US um, uh, objected very strongly to the EU when it blacklisted uh, four US territories, not the US itself, but Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, Guam, and, um, and the US Mariana Islands, I think, Northern Mariana Islands, I think, uh, were, were, were blacklisted by, by the EU for, uh, for failure to cooperate with the European Union. Um, and the US disputed that. And the US tried to, to question whether the list was being put together in a technical measure, in a technical manner, or whether it was done for political or, or, or diplomatic geopolitical reasons. Um, so that's that's where the pressure will come from rather than the IMF or World Bank. But but even if the, the EU is acting unilaterally, there is obviously as well scope for other um, for other parts of the world to do so as well. Um, there's the old adage that um, uh, diplomacy is the art of, of getting someone uh, to, to, to have it your way. Um, so uh, it's possible that these actors uh, around the world are looking at it and seeing whether there's a, a way to maybe mold the project and change the criteria so it reflects their, their tax norms as well or instead. Do um, the, are EU members from time to time included on blacklists historically? Or can they be? Uh, no. So the, the criteria right now expressly prohibit the EU member states um, from, from being added to the, to the blacklist. Um, so every part of the EU is exempted from it. And uh, so that there, might, there may be, mm, sorry, go ahead. So I'm just gonna follow up to say that might change in future. So one of the demands that we didn't highlight that has been made by the European Parliament is that the European Parliament wants EU member states to be subjected to the same scrutiny as on a level playing field as as, as jurisdictions outside, and so does European Commission. That, of course, is a key part of extending the power of the European Union over taxation and taking that power from member states. But the member states need to unanimously agree to that. And the fact is that there's a large number, not just one or two, but a large number that would veto outright in a heartbeat the inclusion of any member states, let alone themselves, on, on, on the blacklist. So it's unlikely to happen in the current environment, but events dear boy events might might change and 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 affect government thinking just a, one brief comment on that and i think randall may want to ask a, a question uh, so from an ifc's perspective uh, on the one hand um you've explored or, or suggested that uh these blacklists perhaps part of a wider project in the ifc not directed at the ifc's but but from an ifc perspective uh if eu members themselves can't be included on, on the list it does uh, certainly feel that there's certainly some tar targeting of IFCs and, and as you say, that could in increase in the future. That was more, yeah. more of an observation, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I, I agree with that observation. <laughs> yeah, your questions suck. Um. <laughs> blame, blame the attendees, not me. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Um, if I might kind of go back to your last slide, because one of the, the concerns that, that I have and others is uh, how quickly we're going to see um, criteria such as zero tax or something that the IFCs can't meet, which places them on the blacklist, and how quickly that might happen and what we might do uh, to try and minimize or prevent or prepare for that happening. Now, I noted on the uh, last bullet point was greater collaboration. Now, we've been talking about that for decades, uh, but we're so busy fighting with each other, we can never collaborate. So I, I'm just wondering what suggestions you might have and, and get that crystal ball out again. I'm, I'm happy was to- Is that a better it. question? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're all great questions, Randall. Um, uh, but the- well, mine was got... better, wasn't it? <laughs> That's just an example to... of people fighting between themselves and, and exactly. that not being productive. We're all on the same side. 
I'm, I'm happy to ask for this one. I'm happy to answer this one as well. In terms of the future moves, it, it is very heavily dependent on another project, which is the OECD's digital tax program, uh, pillar two of which includes a, a global minimum tax proposal. And if that were to go ahead, and if, they, if a consensus can be reached on that, that's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the downside, well, we know what the downsides are. It, it stigmatizes uh, the payment of, of, of lower tax rates. And in fact, some of the tax rates that have been proposed, 12% minimum, are higher than some headline tax rates paid in the EU. Hungary has a 9% has a tax rate, for example. So it potentially changes the entire global makeup on tax. But the positive sense is it might take some of the uh, political momentum out of uh, pressure on zero tax being a criteria on per se. Because if a multinational group or a structure has to pay a 12% tax rate across all of its um, activities worldwide, regardless of which countries it's, it's active in, and regardless of what the headline tax rate is in those countries, then one individual country where one subsidiary or or parent is located um, is irrelevant to the total amount that's paid because you have to pay that 12% minimum anyway. So as a result, it might be that that slows down and makes, makes some of the actors think twice about going further and including that as a criterion. And the second thing is also looking at it from the EU member states perspective, and they're the ones that make the decision. If you were to say, and so all these discussions don't just use zero tax jurisdictions, but it's zero or low or zero or nominal tax jurisdictions. Um, it depends wholly on what the term nominal means, because as noted, Hungary's got a 9% corporate income tax rate. I think Romania has 10%, Bulgaria 11%, Ireland famously 12.5%. None of these is a high tax rate, but they're also not 0%, nor are they trying to replicate 0%. They're not trying to have that rate to be pools of capital. They're using it to, to they're actually applying it to, to, to all economic activity. So as a consequence, um, you know, where they set the balance will determine whether EU member states are implacably opposed or only opposed for now and, and will resign themselves to it later on. So crystal ball is a bit hazy on that. And a lot of these measures are based upon uh, them becoming global standards and so on. But of course, the United States and, and other large uh, juris jurisdictions can essentially pick and choose those that suit them. Um, US, of course, hasn't not, is not participating in CRS. Uh, do you think that that may change, particularly in terms of uh, these similar measures being ad adopted in the US or imposed upon the US? Well, in the, the, the U.S., we'll, we'll have to wait and see now, of course, with the change of uh, president. But um, the, the U.S. did take a, a fairly meaningful step uh, earlier this year when, when Congress uh, uh, adopted uh, it's the, the Corporate Transparency Act, uh, which is a UBO register for U.S. companies and also companies from other jurisdictions, U.S. protection. U.S. protectorates are included in that as well. U.S. V. U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. Um, so it, it, yes, it's going to take a, it, it. The timeline for that to become effective is uh, is is a year. Um, uh, but then also within the Corporate Transparency Act, which is to me the more interesting aspect of it, for everyone, you know, for people sitting outside the U.S. is that. Congress is required to conduct a study as to whether other vehicles like partnerships or trusts need to be included in the in in this new corporate transparency regime. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see about that. But you know, we 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 all know, uh, I'm sure, about uh, there's a lot of uh, business uh, trust business that moved to the U.S. in the last few years. Uh, how and and those trusts don't report in the U.S. At least most of them, um, they're foreign trusts. They're not U.S. taxpayers. So will Congress, in the course of its study, conclude that it's appropriate for those trusts to continue to have no reporting obligations in the U.S. Um, 
I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe under a Trump presidency, that, that might have been uh, the, the result, but it uh, may not be under Biden. Uh, many thanks. Uh, well, unless uh, Randall has any more prize winning questions. I got one. You got one? <laughs> Just one. And, it, and it's one that I hear all the time. Uh, so it, I, it'd be helpful to have the experts answer it instead of me pretend to know what the answer is. Uh, and, and that's that uh, some jurisdictions have said the EU represents a very small part of our business. So we should just ignore them altogether. We shouldn't care about being blacklisted because there aren't any sanctions and just tell them to get stuff. And, uh, you know, we've seen uh, in any event that most jurisdictions end up being terrified by being on the blacklist and respond very quickly with measures to try and get off the blacklist. So uh, do you think there's any merit in adopting the approach of do, do what you want, EU, we don't care, uh, we're happy to be blacklisted, or is there uh, bigger problems to adopting that approach? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I, I can't. I can't advise individual governments on, on on what to do and the approach they should take, and each one has to make up their own minds. Um, but actually, I think there's significant reputational harm that comes from adopting that approach. And that reputational harm does not stop at the Strait of Gibraltar; it goes across the entire world. And the last thing I think that anyone wants is a lot of the other discretionary um, regulatory processes also including every member state, every jurisdiction on the blacklist, um, that could happen. Um, the OECD, if it were to blacklist or to say that the, the tax regime in jurisdiction X is abusive, um, then that will be heard around the world as well. And that will be seen as being fairer and more universal than the EU's list and come with significant reputational harm. So I think if a jurisdiction is trying to aim at the higher level of the value chain, in sophistication, in technical expertise, um, in terms of uh, market access around the world, um, and in terms of regulatory standards, I think you've got to make sure that you're compliant with these with these expectations. So I think that's probably the way to go for jurisdictions. Everyone has to make up their own mind, but I think uh, if we're talking about some of the more sophisticated 2.2 jurisdictions, the CDs and the OTs, then it's probably best to comply. Many thanks indeed, Oliver and Robert. And um, yeah, thanks, Randall. Uh, thank, uh, yes, uh, so- <laughs> That didn't sound genuine. <laughs> we certainly have a, a, a very interesting presentation. We've already received some great feedback and people are saying it's an awesome presentation. So thanks again, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And to all those watching, we're looking at uh, working with the BDA, Business Bermuda Development Agency, Step Bermuda. Um, in doing a number of these um, presentations each month. So, so please stay tuned. Uh, we, ha we have one on um, art finance on the 8th of April. So look out for that. Thanks again, everyone. All the best. Thank you Thank very you. much.